Hello, good evening, good afternoon, good night, wherever you folks are located. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the third session of the Policy Matters series. Um, my name is Anika Zaumi, and I'm the Community Engagement and Gender Equality Specialist at the Ontario Council for International Cooperation. It's actually um, been my honor to see this uh, Policy Matters series unfold over the past few months with the support of Kyle Kirby, um, who's been working on um, heading up this initiative. So today we're going to be talking about food security and sovereignty, and this fits in within our larger um, Policy Matters series theme of uh, bringing folks ideas and knowledge to action. Before we get started, I do want to share a land acknowledgement. I want to share specifically that OCIC's office sits on the unceded territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, um, known as Toronto or along settler lines as Toronto. And I myself am actually joining from the unceded territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe on two Rwandan belt and dish with one spoon territory, known along settler lines as St. Catharines, Niagara region, Ontario. When I think about uh, land acknowledgements, I'm really striving to think beyond words and to action. So not just whose land do I live, work and play on, but how does my knowledge of the fact that I live on, un live on unceded territory inform the way that I engage in whatever webinar, event, training, work that I do. For me, a land acknowledgement is a way to create a framework to move beyond words to action, to stand in solidarity with Indigenous folks in my own community, to learn skills that can allow me to serve as a better ally to them in uh, their own fight for justice. So as you folks take part in today's session, I really invite you to think about not just whose land am I on, whose land do I live, work and play on, but actually think about what are the skills or learnings or teachings that I'm gaining here today during today's session that I can take back to my community to stand for social justice, to stand in solidarity and to support my Indigenous communities. So with that, um, and without further ado, it's actually my pleasure to hand it over to Kyle Kirby, who has been um, leading the Policy Matters series development to introduce our incredible speakers for today. Kyle, over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being part of our Youth Policy Training Series. Um, yeah, so I'll just be introducing the speakers for today's session. Um, we have Paige. She's the marketing director at Green Igloo. A charitable organization working to strengthen food sovereignty in remote and indigenous communities to grow fresh and nutritious food locally while creating a space for communities to prosper. Green Igloo builds greenhouses and provides tailored training that embraces the local culture based out of Toronto. Paige is pursuing a Bachelor of Arts degree at X University, majoring in creative industries with a minor in environment and urban sustainability. She is currently stationed in the remote Icelandic town of Petla photographing the Northern Lights for Hotel Ranga, Diamond PR, and South Coast Adventures. With a passion for adventure and community building, Paige is driven to connect people with the surrounding natural element. Oh, environment, sorry about that. Um, next, we have Susanna. Uh, she is the communications coordinator for Local Food and Farm Co-op, formerly, sorry, sorry, formerly founding coordinator at the West End Food Co-op. Susanna played a key role in opening Toronto's first multi-stakeholder food co-op and co-managed the store for six years until its closure in 2018. Susanna holds a BA in Anthropology from the University of Toronto and is currently working on her Master's in Environmental Studies at York University, researching the intersections of biopic food sovereignty, cooperatives, and climate justice. She has spent 10 years working in the food security and cooperative sector in Toronto, including being a founding member of the Toronto Youth Food Policy Council in 2009 and has been involved with a variety of cooperative organizations from housing to childcare to food. Susanna was awarded the Parkdale High Park Community Leadership in 2019 for her community contribution to the West End Food Co-op and the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust. She is currently a member of the Toronto Food Policy Council. And last but not least, we have Cheyenne. Uh, Cheyenne is the owner and farm director of Sundance Harvest, a year-round farm north of the city of Toronto. Sundance Harvest 
produces a four season CSA with our veggies and the additions of meat, fish, mushrooms, vegetables, and more from other biopic farmers across Ontario. The Food Justice Oriented Growing the Margin program is hosted at our farm seasonal and provides biopic youth with a free multi-week hands-on agriculture program for those who would like a career in agriculture. So now after hearing what our great speakers have to offer, you'll now be able to hear from them firsthand. Uh, I will pass it over to Cheyenne. Hi everyone. My name is Cheyenne Sundance. I run a farm called Sundance Harvest and it's located in Toronto, Ontario in a park called Downsview Park if you're familiar with the area. And I'm really excited to talk about my work today. In the first photo, you can see a greenhouse. We have two heated greenhouses, pretty big, um, that we grow a variety of crops. And in this greenhouse, I was growing cucumbers. Next slide. Great, so Sundance Harvest is a farm that's rooted in food justice. I'm gonna get into that and how I got to do that and still run a for-profit farm that pays my employees $18 an hour to start. Um, I grow produce year round with um, many staff. We have five staff, including myself in the summer months. And then we have less staff in the winter simply because things don't grow as fast. Um, and we run a program called Growing in the Margins, and that is how I believe Sundance Harvest does food justice and furthermore food sovereignty work. But I'll get into Growing in the Margins shortly. The photo behind you can see here is cherry tomatoes. Cherry tomatoes are actually one of our most popular crops. We grow like over 200 pounds a week of cherry tomatoes in the, mid the main season. So our main season is like April to October. Next slide. Okay, so on the farm itself, we have two greenhouses and I just signed a lease uh, for a bunch of field space. So the total area of the outdoor field and then the two greenhouses is 1.5 acres, which is actually pretty big considering that many urban farms are been doing this work with Sundance Harvest since September of 2019. So about two years and a bit but I've really pushed a lot to actually get Sundance Harvest to expand so quickly. And it's because, you know, stubbornness pays off. Patience sometimes doesn't. So you can see me here in our first greenhouse. I was actually harvesting winter lettuce and this lettuce was going to our CSA. We grow lettuce in the greenhouses all winter long and it's really fun. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Um, while I'm waiting for the next slide, some of the other crops that we grow at the farm are things like mushrooms. We grow a bunch of mushrooms at the farm. Uh, we have kale, collards, chard, tomatoes, cucumbers. We tend to have crops such as fruiting crops fairly early because we do have heated greenhouses. So our tomatoes, we get to harvest them as early as, you know, the 1st of April. Same thing with cucumbers, same thing with peppers. Uh, next year, we have, um, we're mainly growing a salad CSA. So lots of leafy greens, herbs, root vegetables, and fruiting crops. But we also have a you pick flower operation that's opening uh, spring of 2022. So that's really exciting. So growing in the margins is um, both a drop-in program and a mentorship program. However, right now it is um, a drop-in program simply because the winter time we usually see less participation, which is kind of normal for any um, seasonal program. And growing the margins is a program specifically for black, indigenous, persons of color, youth, ages 18 to 25. However, I'm flexible with the ages, but that's what our funders requirements are. Growing in the Margins is a registered nonprofit. So that means that it's not um, running as a for profit enterprise. And compared to Sundance Harvest, Sundance Harvest, the farm, is a corporation, like it's a legal corporation. Um, and Growing the Margins is itself a nonprofit. So it's as, almost like an arm from Sundance Harvest. Um, but our funds are totally different. 
So I wanted to do this for a few reasons, but the biggest reason is because I wanted Sundance Harvest to be offered as a blueprint for many of the growing in the margins used to see, oh, okay, this is kind of what a profitable farm could look like if I wanted to run one. And for the 12 weeks, we have, I think we have like three cohorts a year and we have a lot of programming. We have, um, you know, the, this program this Saturday or this Sunday, I think, is about composting. So the youth are going on a field trip. They're going to learn about composting. We have seedling. We have business planning, marketing, um, you know, ecological pest management, and a bunch of others. We also have a virtual program for growing the margins starting in January. Next slide. And one of the youth from growing the margins that I think are doing really cool work Obviously, a bunch of them are, but I want to talk about everyone. Uh, her name is Aaliyah Fraser. She runs Lucky Book Farm in Guelph. She literally took Growing in the Margins last fall, and she did her whole season this year. So I was extremely impressed that she did such a quick turnaround and is now running a pretty profitable uh, enterprise. So Sundance Harvest uh, does direct sale. We don't do wholesale simply because there's so much, there's enough of a demand to not warrant the need to do wholesale. We have a weekly Sundance Harvest box, which is called our Sundance box. And what that box is, is every season for 10 weeks, we have a box of vegetables and there's meat and fish and eggs if you want from farmers of color across Ontario. We purchase vegetables from 100% owned BIPOC farms. So like all the whole ownership has to be BIPOC. Um, and we put that into a box, a CSA, and people in Toronto, they order it and we get it delivered out. So in the winter time, we have 50 boxes and then the spring, summer, and fall, uh, we have 150 boxes. So next year, that's when we scale up from 50 to 150, which is pretty fun. We do, you know, seedling starting workshops and a bunch of others. We do one farmer's market, which is Dufferin Grove. Um, and we really try not to do too many farmer's markets because we are kind of dialed in with our CSA. Next slide. So the reason again, why I didn't want to make Sundance Harvest itself a um, non-profit farm is because there's so many farms that are doing such great work in that area. There's Food Chair, there's Black Creek Community Farm, there's Pact. In Toronto, there's not a void of a nonprofit urban farm. That's kind of the bulk of what we see for urban farms in, in Toronto. And they do it so great and they have amazing funding so they can have these really fully formed programs for youth and community members. But I did see a void of a farm that was for profit that was offering year round employment and also you know seasonal employment and was focused on creating a work environment that was you know a very, I think work environment is also run by a black woman. All the farms that I've seen in my travels when I was, you know, 18 backpacking across the West Coast was farms largely run by white people, white women, white men, but people that really didn't fully understand why it made sense having a diverse leadership in your farm. And I didn't want that environment for my farm. I want everyone's experiences to be honored. And I found that I couldn't work at another farm because I could never find any farm with much diversity. Or when I found farms with diversity, sometimes they wouldn't pay a fair wage. So they would do unpaid internships, which is exploitation. So I made the decision that I was going to run Sundance Harvest as a for-profit farm to one, give myself employment because I have to eat too. And then two, be able to create jobs. And then three, show that this could be a profitable model and we do pay a lease so it's not like we get to farm for free it's a very very high lease as much as you can expect from Toronto's market rate um, so we figured it figured it out and now we're running this farm but for the sovereignty and food justice piece I don't see Sundance Harvest really doing that and I that was never the idea of Sundance Harvest because I never wanted a farm as big as we're getting to be controlled by funders Instead, what I decided to do is make Growing in the Margins a nonprofit because that is the special program that I believe does justice related work and sovereignty related work. To solve really food justice, that's more for food insecurity, which has a place as well. But I do believe giving youth an opportunity to be amongst BIPOC youth and also have the education to start their own farms is probably one of the biggest catalysts I can imagine for youth food sovereignty and youth food justice. And 
the youth today are the future. So if I can give them the education for free, the support, the mentorship, and the guidance, and even buy their produce from my CSA to support them economically, then that will create the sovereignty in the future. Well, that's just like what I believe. So I decided to not, you know, give my produce away for free because I couldn't afford to do that. So instead I decided to use my education and share that through Growing the Margins, which is a nonprofit. We get funded by a restaurant called Allo, which is a really cool restaurant in Toronto. I'm very selective with who I choose funds Growing the Margins because our I don't like mining, I don't like pipelines, and some organizations don't like outwardly political views. So I've been very selective with who I choose to fund this program. Um, and that's another reason why I didn't want anyone to fund the farm, because the farm is kind of the more front-facing political part of Sundance Harvest, and growing the margins is kind of like the little sister that provides a beautiful education. Next slide, please. Uh, can you skip two slides now? Great. So starting a career in urban farming. Starting a career in urban farming, um, if you're interested in starting one, the easiest way to is honestly work at a farm. Um, and then aside from that, you can just start your own enterprise. Again, I just went to high school. I don't have any post-secondary degree. I found it silly to go to school, post-secondary school for farming. Um, also, I had like really bad grades. So instead, I just kind of learned as I went. And that's the perfect way to farm. Every single person on this planet has an agrarian past. Every single ancestor of ours at one point grew food. Um, maybe they didn't grow food to sell it. Maybe they just grew it for their family and their community. So that's kind of where you want to get your basis from. It's not some foreign thing that's really difficult to learn. The soil wants to grow biomass. The seed wants to grow and the crop wants to flourish. You just have to have a helping hand and you're probably gonna be okay. Can you skip two slides? And then aside from that, what I would say regarding Sundance Harvest, um, probably like one of the biggest barriers we face starting up is, um, can you skip the slide again? The biggest barrier starting up with Sundance Harvest is again, building diversity within agriculture. We decided to focus more so lately on less frontward facing equity work, but behind the scenes. So having Sundance Harvest be a very visual farm is great, but we actually need policy change and we need deep support with grant programs to get more BIPOC farmers to get started. So I'm on the board of the National Farmers Union Ontario board, and I've been pushing to create the very first ever BIPOC advisory committee for the farmer union across Canada. So that would mean there would be a committee across Canada through the union, uh, which is many farmers are, are in across Canada. And um, this committee would advocate for more grants, more loans, funding, and all of that for BIPOC farmers. But diversity with the sustainable industry matters because for something like farming, most of the world is actually, most of our food is produced by small scale farms, especially in the global south. So having even diversity within small scale farming matters because most of our food is grown by small scale farming. Small scale farming is going to be more diverse um, in terms of what crops are being grown, less likely to do monocrop culture, and also the farmers are more likely to be in touch with the land. If you're farming one acre compared to four hectares, you're probably gonna understand each corner of your plot way better because you're gonna be on boots to the ground doing work instead of being in a tractor and not being as close to the ground and seeing the biological activity. So diversity within sustainable industries simply matter because the more people in good green jobs, the better future we have regarding the climate crisis. The more people farming in an ecological way that respects the earth, the better food system we have. Um, and again, just having simply more representation and more diversity and more leadership of people of color means we can have more of that great farming. That's kind of the way it goes. Um, and I feel like that's all I'm going to say. Um, I hope I put in enough uh, for the slideshow. And if you have any questions, you, I guess you can ask me whenever the questions are. Bye. Thank you so much for presenting. That, like, I think as a uh, young biopic youth in Toronto it really resonated with me and especially seeing how like youth can just get involved so easily it just uh it's very uh I guess 
what is it, inspiring in a sense. So yeah, I'll pass it off to Susanna now. Thanks so much, Kyle. And thanks, Cheyenne. You know, I'm such a huge fan of your work and I really appreciate um, you going through all these different pieces about um, how you came on your journey and um, all the different things that are happening for you um, with Sundance Harvest. Um, so hi everyone, thanks so much for uh, joining today. Um, my name is Susanna Radikoff and I'm with uh, the Local Food and Farm Co-ops. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so I'm gonna try and keep it really brief today. Um, so just gonna chat a little bit about me, about LFFC, some Ontario food issues, and then co-ops as solutions. Next, please. So there's my face. Um, so I really like food uh, and I like how co-ops help empower people to get involved in their work. Uh, I've been working for LFFC for about five years. Uh, I manage their communications, marketing, design, social media, their internal and external comms. So I basically make sure that we talk to each other and that everyone knows what we're about and to make sure that we're always growing. Um, also, I really like learning. In 2020, I decided it was time for me to go back to school and I wanted to ensure that my work and my interests could grow together. Um, so my research is, as I mentioned before, um, in BIPOC co-ops, um, focusing on food and farming as uh, my entry point, since it's a large topic um, about BIPOC co-ops and um, always keeping guided by sustainability, climate justice as well, because in these times, it's just what we have to do to keep a thread in order to keep moving forward and staying relevant. Uh, if we're not working towards climate justice in our work, then we're not thinking long-term enough. I also want to emphasize that I'm not an expert here. Um, I can speak to what I know of food issues and co-ops from my experience, but my colleagues who are regionally based in Northern Ontario, for instance, are better equipped to speak to their unique challenges. Though so I'll try to do them justice by touching on the things the best I can. Um, as I said, I really like learning and every time I get to do a presentation like this or be a part of a panel, I really love learning from all of you and my fellow panelists and attendees included. Next slide, please. Um, so at LFFC, we have a network of co-ops, um, 45 of them and growing, who, support, who we support with our network. We're a second tier co-op, so it means we are a cooperative of co-ops. <laughs> so um, our members are from startup co-ops to conversion. So if someone say started a farm or other business and now they want to be a cooperative, um, to larger other second tier co-ops um, like uh, Ontario Co-op of Association, who are the support network for co-ops all throughout the province. And then also La Siembra Coco Camino. Uh, you might see their chocolate and um, things like that in their cocoa um, throughout stores. Um, so they have member co-ops who are farming co-ops run by farmers in Mexico and South America. Um, so they provide a market for their fair trade products and then to be manufactured here in Ontario and distributed. We also have individual and advocate members who aren't co-ops, but they just kind of like the work that we do. So they're interested in the resources that we have, which brings me to those resources. So what we do is we provide training and workshops. Um, we also have a mentorship program, which builds on one of the greatest strengths of co-ops, the ability to support each other instead of being a direct competition. Um, our mentorship program connects experts in the field with those who are needing to work on specific areas, whether it be things in business planning, marketing, governance, or other aspects of their operations. Uh, we also support folks going through the process of strategic planning, business strategy, and cooperative ways. Uh, we have resources for um, boards of directors and their structure, bylaws, policies, those sorts of things. And we also create networks in which members can connect to each other to share ideas, equipment, or bulk purchasing, things like that. Next slide, please. So we're a provincial network. Uh, we have regional coordinators throughout the province. We have a coordinator in the Northwest, Northeast, um, and then myself who's communications, our, prime, our um, project manager who is in the South as well too, and we share the Southern regional coordination role. Um, and also our um, Northern Food Distribution Network coordinator. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that project um, a little bit further down, um, as well as our Indigenous Relations coordinator too. Um, so a little bit about the North um, and South relations. So it's a bit of a question about where the specific border is between North and South. 
Um, there's different definitions out there and including between two of our funders actually, which parts um, the North starts in. Um, but typically Northern Ontario begins the French River, Lake Nipissing and the Matawa River, North Bay uh, and the North Bay, which calls itself kind of the gateway to the North. Um, we'll take a look at that on the next slide, but we're not going there just yet. Um, my Northern colleagues report that in many parts of the North, food access is particularly scarce. Um, there's also less people. Um, the North has a total population of approximately 810,000 people, which is about 5.5% of the provincial population. The Northwest in itself um, has just under 250,000 people spread out over more than 500,000 square kilometers. So communities are really isolated. They're really spread out from each other. Much of the food that gets flown into communities from the South isn't great quality by the time it gets there and ends up being expensive given the distance and effort expenditure it takes. It's also more difficult to grow. Um, there are harsher climates as well too, which limits things with some of the growing seasons. Um, in Southern Ontario, it's not that there's no food access issues in the South. They are definitely here and, and there's huge links to poverty, food insecurity, lack of affordable housing, adequate jobs, uh, as well as tied to factors such as racial background as well too. Um, but also because of our warmer climate, more food is grown locally close to home here and it's easier, closer to transport to get to the customer in good condition. Um, there's also more food security support organizations in the South, comparatively speaking. Additionally though, even though our government knows that the North needs investment in food infrastructure, um, the funding bodies that fund the North are still based in the South. Um, there's many miscommunications that create barriers to having these funds go to where they're actually needed the most. Um, and other issues such as time allowed to do their projects um, or travel expenses or how um, folks in the North engage their partners. So enter the NFDN, um, which is the Northern Food Distribution Network. Uh, it's a project of um, our Trade Roots uh, project. And um, the Northern Food Distribution Network uh, was created to be able to connect various different um, communities in the North. Um, so when a project pops up in um, Northern Ontario, and you know, quite often they'll have um, the people, but maybe not the funding um, to be able to make things happen. And it might die out a little bit because it doesn't have the momentum to keep going. Or maybe they have funding, but they haven't found um, the location, the land, the right people or the infrastructure yet. Um, and so it's hard to be able to um, continue on a project when you don't have those resources. So creating the Northern Food Distribution Network, um, it's a way in which um, there's a, uh, at the same table, you have funders, you have nonprofit organizations, you have indigenous leadership, you have food and egg support organizations. You, there's also with them, they can create together food innovation projects that create real value for Northerners by Northerners. Um, and also just a small plug that we have a webinar series that we have started and will continue throughout the fall. Um, and we're going to be also uh, releasing a large report on value chain coordination, which is highlighting the challenges and opportunities in connecting food communities throughout the North. So those things will be coming up. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so here are a couple of maps um, that were put together by a summer student of ours. Um, and uh, so the first one um, demonstrates the cell tower distribution in the north. So if you notice how it's crowded around the southern edges, think about how much more difficult it is without all the things that we take for granted, such as reliable cell service, radio, internet service, all the things that are essential for communications when you're dealing with the logistics of moving food from place to place. And the second one here demonstrates the fly-in communities. These are communities that do not have road access. You can't drive there. So, um, and you can see how they're clustered more in some parts that are a little bit higher up in, in Northern Ontario. The third map demonstrates the winter ice road access. So these are communities that only have road access when it's cold enough to freeze over and create roads. The winter means more freedom, more ability to travel between communities, to visit friends and family, more ability to, ability to transport food to remote community, for example. So when you think about things like climate change and how this affects communities that rely on the winter to freeze over their roads in order for them to get access to food. When our winters are balmy down south, this can mean folks in the north can't get to the food and transportation that they rely on year after year in winter. If you don't mind just clicking on the link, um, that, I don't know if you can do that here to get to the interactive map that I also had too. Okay, great. 
Um, so this is also um, a demonstration of um, resources in the North versus South. So uh, if you can see on your screen there, so the border that's um, outlined there, that is what's considered Northern Ontario. Comparatively speaking, that piece that continues around that, that border that goes around um, the, the Great Lakes, you can see Toronto there, and then up a little bit, um, you see Ottawa. So that's considered South compared to that huge landmass that's considered to be North, right? But it's only 5.5% of the population that is up in Northern Ontario. And I don't know if you can click on um, the little boxes that you have there, um, a couple of them too, like for example, the highways. So you look how concentrated that is in the South when you're talking about road access. Service providers, again, the next one down, you can see it's really, really, you know, concentrated a couple more in the North as well too, but still it's more concentrated in the South. Small business centers, for example, another one, and a very similar pattern. Thank you. I'll go to the next slide. Can you have a moment, please? Awesome. So yes, so why co-ops? Um, so co-op building opportunities for co-ops and collaboration in Northern communities has been a way in which to empower groups to tackle food issues together. So co-ops are for having a say in what happens in our communities. We all have power, whether we realize it or not, and co-ops are a way in which we can utilize that power to be a part of meaningful decision-making in our work, such as keeping food grown in the North in the North, uh, connecting producers with consumers, with food hubs, distribution co-ops, in ways that connect people across distances and reduce emissions. Co-ops are a way to recognize that we all have value. We are valued more than just the work that we output. We need to remember this. This is important because our capitalist system wants to reduce us to what we are useful for and how our labor can be extracted and to devalue the other things that we find that would bring us joy in life. Um, but understanding that yeah, such as your friends, fun, family, taking time off, caring for the planet. This is why I love co-ops because they have this triple bottom line of people, planet, and profit instead of solely focusing on profit. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we may or may not be familiar with the seven cooperative principles, but these are universal principles that all co-ops follow. Um, and this slide's images and words are borrowed from my passion project, slide project, research work with um, Freedom Dreams Cooperative Education, uh, which is an online educational space focusing on the history and erasure of BIPOC co-ops and, and supporting the next generation of BIPOC folks looking into starting cooperatives. And next slide, please. Which brings me to my final point, which is that we need more diversity in co-ops. Uh, I've been working in co-ops for over a decade now. I live in a housing co-op. I work for a food farm co-op. And I can confidently say the majority of folks that we find in these spaces are predominantly white. And especially of the many of the credit unions, larger federations of co-ops, majority of folks are middle-aged or reaching retirement there's a big gap. And then there's youth who are getting interested in ways to get involved in workplace empowerment, or more rather just getting fed up with being exploited and realizing there are alternatives. Um, Co-ops are for everyone and they arise when there's a need for a certain group that's not being met. And marginalized folks, BIPOC folks, queer, LGBTQ, 2S folks, youth who've been told directly, indirectly that we are less value than the mainstream, what we think we should be, Here's where there's value in exploring what this model can do for us. And right now, COVID is an opportunity to see things differently and to be positioned to explore ways in which we can work cooperatively and sustainably together. And I think that's it. Last slide. Thanks. That's all for me. Thank you for coming to speak. I never really noticed, I never really knew much about co op. So just hearing you speak really. It's a new perspective on food security, even within Toronto and that South North connection. Um, but thank you for speaking again. Uh, I'll pass it off to Paige for our final presentation. Okay, hello everyone. Awesome, thanks so much, Kyle. And thank you, Suzanne and Cheyenne. That was really awesome listening to. It's rare that I hear from co-ops and urban farms too. So. 
really educational for me as well. Um, so yeah, I'm from Green Igloo. Um, we can just get right on into it. I'll tell you a little bit about myself starting out. Um, so I'm a university student at X University. Um, I'm an adventure photographer and that's what's currently brought me into this van here. Um, sorry for my horrible background and display here. I'd give you a tour, but there really isn't much to show you. Um, I'm a fresh food and outdoors enthusiast, and I am from Toronto. You can go to the next slide. Forgot to mention I'm the marketing director, and that's what I do for Green at Glue. Um, but yeah, Green at Glue is the really cool part, and that's why I'm here today. I'm really excited to be talking on behalf of Green at Glue. Um, yeah, we can go to the next slide. So if you want to click play, there's a little time lapse there. There should be. Sorry, it doesn't look like it's working. <laughs> okay, that's okay. There is a time lapse there. It um it shows basically the process of a dome being built. So basically, Green Igloo works to build growing dome greenhouses in remote communities, and we partner with these communities that reach out to us and approach us. Um, we figure that communities know best, and we basically equip them with everything they need need to work towards food sovereignty on their own terms. So we give them this greenhouse infrastructure and we develop it alongside a team of our partner in their communities. And we also give them training that embraces culture, leaving them with a remote farming team. Go to the next slide. So with this solution, communities are able to grow their own affordable and fresh produce in harsh climates, while also having space to warm up from the cold and let their community prosper. So pictured here, you can see the domes. Um, they're quite pretty. Um, and you can also see the hydroponic towers that we use in many of our domes um, as chosen by the communities we partner with. But here you can see these vertical hydroponic towers in the top left photo. Um, that's one of the growing methods that communities may choose to use and they can grow their crops by this means and it reduces the amount of water used and it allows as many crops to be grown in a small amount of space. We can go to the next slide. Awesome. So I'm going to show you more of what we do because we do a lot more than just build greenhouses in these communities. So the, the grown domes alone, they withstand wind speeds of over 180 kilometers per hour and seven feet of direct snow, which is more than enough to be able to withstand in really harsh cold climates up in Canada's northern region. And then, as I mentioned, we do the local training with each community that we work with. Um, but we also offer education. So our education is surrounding horticulture, nutrition, food sovereignty, food insecurity, and this is a way of giving back to the communities and allowing them to gain the knowledge needed to really take food sovereignty into their own hands. And then lastly, community engagement. Um, we basically help communities take a stand on their local food goals and develop a place to gather where they can pretty much do whatever they please within this space. You can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So why do we do this? So food insecurity is not only an issue in the North. It's an issue in Northern remote indigenous communities and it's a lot closer to home than you may expect. Growing up, I was from, I grew up in Aurora, which is a small town just North of Toronto, if you know it. And I had no idea that many of the neighboring communities just in Ontario alone are struggling with food insecurity and working towards food sovereignty themselves. Second of all, um, food sovereignty is directly connected to the health and well-being well -being of our environment and communities. So our model extends beyond greenhouse infrastructure and it basically ends up making it so that it's a self-sustainable model within the communities. And then thirdly, food insecurity is a really complex issue and it requires the collaboration of communities. So it's our hope that by connecting with communities and connecting them with each other, They'll be able to help each other along their way working towards food sovereignty. The next slide. So this is a peek at where the grown domes and where Green Igloo has touched base. These are the communities that have reached out to Green Igloo and we've been fortunate enough to be able to work with these communities to develop these models where they can take these domes into their own hands and build crops. Um, grow crops, they can grow anything from tomatoes to cucumbers to kale, 
or they can just use it as a place for healing and growth. So we began in Nunavut and there are three domes within several different communities. And then in Listigouge, Quebec, it's a very remote community there. Um, there are two domes there. One is, you'll see it there, it's pictured in front of a school. Then there's Gascapegia, Quebec. Uh, there you can see one of our greenhouse operators, greenhouse technicians up on the dome themselves. Very welcoming environment, as you can see. And uh, then there's Nantukavut, Labrador. Um, that's a very recent project. There's one dome that's been built there. And Lax Palam, CC, that is a dome that's currently in progress. So we're gonna have a lot of updates coming up on that soon. And it's a student-led project, which is really neat because the students were able to identify an issue in food sovereignty and food insecurity at home with there just being one grocery store and a ferry that delivers their food to that one small grocery store. So they started a dome at their school. And then in 2022, we're welcoming a lot of different communities um, into our work and we're really excited to see where that goes. Go to the next slide. So Green Egg Group began as a student-led project at Ryerson or now it's X University. And this was back in 2013. So Enactus is basically a student group where students are able to work on projects that have you know, socioeconomic and environmental effects and impacts. And they're able to bring them to life depending on their pitch and if it is successful and they're able to develop funding through this, but it's, it's a really great opportunity to do so. So a small team um, with our founders, Stephanie Nieto and Ben Canning, they were a part of an Actus Ryerson and they decided that they wanted to take a stand on food insecurity and learn more about the communities facing this. So they started Green Egg Group. It was originally called Growing North and then it became Green Egg Group years later. So then this brought the group to the north. It brought us to Nunavut. And they were initially drawn to a small community, which is home to the first dome build. And then Grinigui went on to build more domes within uh, Nunavut. Grinigui then became a registered charity in 2019. Obviously a lot has happened in between all of this, but that was a very pivotal year because it's basically what's enabled Grinigui to be where it is today. And now Grinigui was focusing on all remote, com remote communities in Canada. And that's gonna extend the reach of, you know, the work that Grinigui does on food sovereignty. So that's very exciting. You can go to the next slide. So things that I've learned as a newbie in, uh, in food sovereignty. So I'm 19 years old and I started with Grinigui uh, 2020, June. So it's right before COVID hit. And it was my first time volunteering for an organization beyond just high school, small remote, small um, opportunities there. But I'd really like to encourage anyone in this call to take the leap and begin volunteering because you never know where it will take you. And all that I've learned through working with Green Igloo, I never could have really imagined it. I thought it would just be a small, awesome mission to be a part of, but it's been a lot more than that. And it's a really unique team too. Second of all, um, I've learned that impact can exist beyond the borders of your hometown, even at a young age. I think that's something that really shows with Green Igloo's story and how that they were a few students from Toronto and now it's a national charity organization. So that's just been really cool to see. And then in terms of marketing, um, I've had to adjust to marketing for a charity organization. Going into it, I was very consumed thinking it was a lot about social media followings and aesthetics. Um, but it is not about that at all. <laughs> it's all about approachability and making valuable connections with these communities and really being transparent about that. So that's been something that's been really cool to see because that's obviously a lot more enjoyable for anyone in marketing to be able to have fun with that. And then lastly, what I've learned is that food sovereignty needs work across all borders. It doesn't apply just to the North. It is across all of Canada and there's so much we can do um, even though it is definitely a very complex issue, there are multiple ways to tackle it, which you've seen just within this event alone. Um, yeah, and we can go on to the next slide. Awesome. So key takeaways from Green Igloo and a lot of our learnings over the past couple of years as well. So getting to know the communities themselves um, that Green Igloo works with is ultimately what's helped Green Igloo evolve to better understand food sovereignty and how we can actually help. The communities know a lot better than we do, and listening and hearing them out is the best thing we can do to work towards this issue. 
Secondly, there's not one single solution to food security and food sovereignty, um, but there are models that do work to tackle these issues. To tackle these issues, um, I wanted to note too that you know food security is the end goal, not production levels, and that's one thing that Green Acres kind of readjusted in their model. But food sovereignty is a way to achieve this goal by putting food security in the hands of the people and not these big southern-led corporations. And then. No one knows what a community needs better than they do. I know I've said that before, but I really wanted to reiterate that. So we support local food goals and complement traditional food ways as dictated and chosen by the communities we partner with. And lastly, starting as a student project, clinically shows the power of youth innovation and no idea is too big. Um, there's so many opportunities right now and it's really exciting to see what we can do with it. The next slide, please. That's everything from me. Um, if you want to connect, these are Green Igloo's website and as well as my email. Um, and we're also always open to volunteers too. There are lots of opportunities within Green Igloo and the team is expanding really rapidly. So we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for speaking. Um, yeah, I think as someone who's volunteered with Enactus and then having Anika, one of the of Green Igloo's biggest fangirls. I think you hold a special place in OCIC's uh, network. Um, I definitely like the work you're doing. It's very, it's very like unique. I don't think a lot of people are doing it. So very nice. Um, I guess now I just want to hand it over to a quick Q and A. Um, anyone just raise their hand and or turn their mic on and just come ask a question. Well, I guess as Everyone seems to be a bit shy. I'll ask the first question to get the ball rolling. Um, just to all the speakers, like, what do you think is in relation to food security and sovereignty? What do you think is the best way of not Canadians, but I guess Canadians as a whole coming together towards a common goal? What would be the best goal to achieve? Would it be um, addressing diverse communities, remote communities, or would it be looking after each other in a cooperative lens? or whatever you guys think. Can you repeat the question, please? The question, my question is that if for Canadians itself to deal with food security and food sovereignty as a whole for Canada, what is the best route to attack it? Would it be going through cooperative lenses? Would it be addressing the most marginalized first? Uh, whichever plan works best. I guess I could start. Um... To me, I see tackling food sovereignty and food insecurity as a very collaborative, collaborative issue. And I see a lot of potential of organizations coming together to tackle it together. So for instance, like a lot of our work combined, Susanna and Cheyenne, these types of organizations working together to see what can be a joint effort. And I think that that collaborative approach can make things a lot more empowering and powerful for all remote communities and any community ultimately facing food sovereignty issues. Yeah, um, I would also say as well too, I think that, I mean, food sovereignty, food security, they're very complex issues. It's not one cause, there's not one solution. Um, and I feel like there's a lot of work that can be done um, locally for various different initiatives that are happening in those areas. So like the way that um, Cheyenne addresses food security in the ways that, you know, were not being addressed before and filling the gap that really needed to be filled. That's like addressing it in a really practical way in the way that Paige is saying, um, making sure that um, Green Igloo is going with what the community leads um, and, uh, and not just going in and telling them what to do um, is really like the, the important pieces of making sure something's actually relevant to the community itself. So yeah, I would say multi-pronged approach. I have a quick question. Um, I'd love to know folks, um, I know some of you have answered this already in your presentation, but I'd love to know what inspired you to do work in this space. Um, why, why food security and sovereignty and why now?
I can start, but I also wanted to see if Cheyenne wanted to start since <laughs> she didn't um, was able to get in the last one. Okay, maybe she'll pop back on. Um, I honestly, I wanted to get involved in something that was happening locally in my neighborhood, um, and uh, and so. Um, I found out about West End Food Co-op when it was happening um, and I was interested in food issues and um, had just moved into a housing co-op that was in Parkdale. Um, and so understanding that like literally around the corner from my house, there was going to be a food co-op. I was like, oh, cool. I don't know what that's about, but I want to see. Um, and so just making sure that I was just, you know, um, there and visiting and asking questions and poking around um and uh and yeah just kind of getting involved that way um but I feel like I've always been drawn towards food things and um food and justice go together so and because food is inherently political any kind of food that you choose that you're going to be consuming and we do it three times a day or more um you know there's choices that are behind those things but there's also pieces that are out of our control you know we don't always have access to everything that we want to be able to. We don't always have the ability to have the money to spend on things that are out of our reach. Um, you know, but there's, I feel like everyone has the option and ability to be able to make measures happen in whatever ways they meet themselves where they're at. I can hop in next. Um, I honestly kind of fell into my work with Green Igloo um, I came across a job posting, I think it was spring after COVID hit, so I was at home and definitely feeling a bit of lack of purpose, as most people I think were when COVID hit and jobs were lost and everything, so I was like, oh my gosh, what now? And at the time, I was really getting involved with environmental sustainability, and I really, it was important to me that my work aligned with my values. And it never had in the past. I'd always just got in part-time jobs wherever I could and and never really put priority to my values with where I'd work. So I wanted to change that. And I found Green Igloo's posting and it aligned with my values and it was really inspiring. And it was a topic I didn't know much about. Um, so I knew it would be a good learning experience. And then I applied to volunteer and well, of course we're welcome to any volunteers. So then I started to volunteer. <laughs> I guess I can go next. Um, what inspired you in my journey? So food security and food sovereignty, I don't believe that they're similar. They're very distinctive, especially if you're Black or Indigenous, you probably know this. Like food security itself is simply, you can go to the food bank and get craft dinner. Food security doesn't necessarily mean culturally relevant food or food that's nutritious or food that you want or food that's accessible to you. But food sovereignty is a totally different ball game. And ultimate food sovereignty, I haven't seen exist in Canada as much because from what I understand with my friends and my community, it involves land back. So until land back really happens and ultimate food sovereignty can take place. Um, when I was staying in Cuba for a bit when I was 18, I saw inklings of food sovereignty happen, but ultimately within the state of capitalism, true food sovereignty cannot take fruition. So the work I do, I would say, is more in line with food justice, uh, because to say I do food sovereignty work, that means that I'm controlling policy, that means I'm controlling borders. It also means I have so much control, which I don't have as a 24-year-old girl. Um, so food sovereignty work, I wouldn't say really anyone I know fully can do yet, because we are still confined by the state of white supremacy. But uh, food justice work, I got started in that because I was interested in challenging a lot of the current settler mentality regarding one, like food and education. So having a space for and by youth that youth can lead their own journey and destiny. I also wanted a space that was strictly BIPOC for education because there's a bunch of other farms, you know, organic farms near Guelph that can teach education about farming but everyone looks the same. Everyone really has the same lived experiences and there's not that diverse sense of leadership. And that's something that I really wanted. So I wouldn't say at all, I do food sovereignty work. I think like it, it's very difficult to do that work. Um, and there's some amazing food sovereignty activists who I know, 
but I would say more so I do food justice work and I just got it started because I want to see something shift and things are shifting within agriculture, which is cool. What, what, a, what great stories and beginnings for everybody. Um, so I think that would be it for the question, unless anyone else has any, probably not perfect. Um, so I'm gonna start the breakout rooms. Um, so I'll be splitting you guys up into three breakout rooms, each for one of the presenters. And there will be a jam board where you can write down your points or just take down notes from your breakout and then share to the group after we're done. Um, the breakout's gonna be 15 to 20 minute long and I will be starting them now, so. Perfect, I think everyone's back to wants to be back. Um, so I hope you guys had a very engaging um, breakout room and breakout session. Um, if anybody from either the sessions or the speakers wanna share key takeaways or anything interesting you learned, please take the floor. And if no one wants to go, I will be, yeah, I was really about to nominate Paige to speak. So perfect. Thank you, Paige. <laughs> cool. So if you wanted to share your screen, I'd love to quickly show the Jamboard that my breakout room created. Okay. Perfect. Okay, let me move this one out of the way. Um, so basically, uh, for the purpose of the breakout room, I just wanted to get creative and get everyone thinking about how culture can be intertwined with, um, you know, a lot of different methods to tackling food sovereignty and food insecurity. So my question was, what are all of the ways you can think of to use your own dome greenhouse? And I said, you could get creative um, or be more practical, uh, just anything people would think of. And it was neat to see what people came up with. The main one I wanted to highlight is, let's see, where, where did it go? Uh, I think it was whatever it organically becomes. So that was kind of the message that I really wanted to get out there. It's that, you know, each community's method to tackling and reaching, you know, food sovereignty is their own and they're welcome to let their culture grow within it and that's also what separates food sovereignty from food insecurity is that culture is very intertwined into it into the policy making and I think that's a really important takeaway to, to get from it so yeah I just thought that was neat if you wanted to take a look into that the links posted thank you um, I guess I'll pass it off to Susanna now I feel like I've been second a lot um maybe you can hear from Cheyenne Sure. Yeah, sounds good, Susanna. Um, yeah, so we just like went freestyle with it because I felt like it was more organic and I don't like Jamboard. It's like too much for me sometimes. <laughs> so we had like a lot of cool questions. One of the questions we got was how do nonprofits if they're going into a community that isn't their own, like culturally or, you know, BIPOC, -ly, how do they respect that community and go in with kind of well wishes and the biggest takeaway I said is to understand what resources you're bringing in and the biggest mistakes nonprofit bring is thinking their resources their leadership when it's almost never that there's always that auntie in a community who knows everyone and knows everyone's names and their kids and everyone comes over for tea and she is the town leader basically or there's that family that's always there for people they cook when they're sick and basically you need to know those town leaders that already exist in someone's neighborhood or community or again, towns. Um, and to partner with them and be their support and not their leader. Because that's really not where nonprofits are supposed to come in with their funding, they're there to support that community. So they have to let those leaders that are naturally there organically lead. And then the second thing I said was for nonprofits that are trying to figure out when they're moving into these communities, like what to do and what people want with programs, that's when you partner with those existing leaders and you have a town hall, you have a fun town hall with lots of food and those leaders are co-leading with you. And then the community members usually feel more comfortable and confident to speak because they have people there that they already know. 
So that was, the, that was a really good question um, that someone asked. And then, yeah, I feel like that was, there's a bunch of other ones about like grants and stuff and other things, but I like that one. That one was really good. That's all. Bye. Thank you. Uh, I'm passing off to Susanna. Then. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I, in our group also, um, we just had a bit of a jam sesh, um, but not on the jam board. And um, it was a really great conversation. Um, we started talking about food security, um, so food sovereignty, um, just wanted to uplift um, Shan's excellent points um, about that. Um, and uh, talking about culturally re relevant food um, and access within communities. Um, there was an excellent point brought up about how Canada does not have a food security policy um, and, uh, and how food banks um, are not par permanent solutions, um, but are considered to be currently part of the food supply chain. This is really uh, not appropriate. Food banks were um, created as a Band-Aid solution and they were never created to be able to be permanent. Um, charity food is not a solution. And if you see what gets thrown into like the um, charity food bin, like if you're not willing to eat that yourself, like there's no way you should be donating that. Like there, we're talking about food with dignity and that's not a solution to that. Um, we also talked about, um, oh, um, also in terms of the, the differential access to food and food sovereignty, um, how it's also uh, really segregated by neighborhood. Um, and um, there was um, someone in our group who um, had brought up the um, uh, work that she had done in um, doing some research in Jane Finch area um, about um, uh, food security, food access there. Um, and, uh, and also just um, uh, to also that point um, that there, it's tricky because in certain areas and Jane Finch being one of them, um, not only is Jane Finch one of the highest policed areas um, where like at the grocery store, you will have more security present than you will in any other neighborhood um, in downtown core. But at the same time, you also have higher priced groceries. So the exact same groceries you would get at the same grocery store somewhere else in a different neighborhood is actually 7% more in Jane Finch. So not only are they like taxed with like more mental health and wellness and um, issues in terms of like the trauma of going into the grocery store and being policed. But on top of that, they also actually have um, to pay more for their groceries than you get anywhere else. Um, so yeah, those are some things that we were reflecting on. Oh, thank you for, well, it sounds like you guys all had engaging discussion for your breakout rooms. I think the uh, intersection of talk of intersection of sectors in food security and the rest of, uh, I guess, advocacy work and policy is such a main topic. Um, I guess I'll pass it off to Anika for closing then. Yeah, thanks so much, Kyle. Actually, before I do close, I'd like to ask if any participants today would like to share some of their thoughts, maybe the their own impression of the breakout rooms. So I'm actually going to give folks a couple minutes to share. Feel free to unmute yourself or turn on your camera as you'd like. Hi, I'm Shatabdi. I was in Susanna's group. And one of the things that we talked about that really, really struck out to me was the concept of food with dignity. Because I think a lot of the times when we think of having food available, as food is available as we've seen, but it's not always the food that we want and the food that we need to live the kind of lives that we want to. And that was something we also talked about in our groups that also I think we all see where it's not culturally relevant food or it's not, if you're a vegetarian, the vegetables are more expensive than eating the meat is or the processed foods, things like that. Yeah, and that was really interesting and it was a great discussion, wonderful speakers and everything. Thank you. Thanks, Shatabdi. Is there anyone else who has maybe a final thought, um, reflection, thank you you'd like to share? I love awkward silences, but I'm going to assume that this means that folks 
um, have already heard or shared what they need to. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually, I actually did um, Paige uh, end up figuring out the video. So I wanted to show the time lapse to folks because I just think it's pretty neat. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so cool. This one is up in uh, Nunavut, actually. So you can see the conditions for working are a bit, uh, bit challenging. <laughs> yeah. And what are what are the um, these uh, greenhouses made out of? Gosh, I feel like I'm the wrong person to ask that question, but it's like this polycarbon tile, um, and they're each individually installed onto the dome. And um, more details are on our website. <laughs> I'm really oh. not a good person explaining that one, but um, yeah, it comes together really nicely within the first couple. Yeah, of I love how it just, it's like yeah. a jigsaw puzzle. It's very well designed. Yeah, and I'm sure neat. a lot of that was also made intentionally for transport, right? It's like how flat it packs and how absolutely like, small it is. Yeah. One of I mean, the sister amazing. companies of Green Igloo is called Arctic Acres, and they kind of, mm -hmm. you know, take on that challenge as well with us so it's really neat having them to collaborate on uh on the domes and building them yeah thanks for thanks for sharing this and sorry about the tech difficulties i'm glad we could finally <laughs> that's okay yeah. no problem <laughs> um so with that actually it's my um pleasure to i'm just so mesmerized by this stop motion or this time lapse um, but it's actually my pleasure to thank all of the speakers again before i do close i am going to launch a very quick poll to I think you've muted yourself oh good job <laughs> thank you um so as I was saying I've launched a very short poll it's only five questions long um this is completely anonymous and will not be shared not even during this session today um this is just for OCIC's internal reporting and so that we can improve our programming in the future. So I just launched it. If folks can take just a couple of minutes, um, shouldn't even take a couple of minutes, just a minute or so to answer um, these poll questions, it would be really, really helpful for us to improve our programming and just to get a sense of whether, um, how useful today's session was. But with that, it is my sincere, sincerest pleasure to thank all of you for being here today and especially local food and farm co-ops, Green Igloo and it to today's session and sharing their insight and expertise and wisdom with us. Um, please feel free to drop your um, Instagram or social media handles in the chat and I'm sure folks would love to um, be in touch. Um, but for those of you that um, are interested or really enjoy the Policy Matters session, don't forget that this time next week we will be having another session um, from Ideas to Action held in partnership with uh, taking it global in Toronto Youth Cabinet, um, they will actually be helping you uh, take some of the ideas or thoughts or reflections that you've gained over the past few sessions um, and starting to put it into action in your own community. So don't miss that. And then November 6th and 7th, we'll have a weekend hackathon hosted in partnership with the Canadian Council for Young Feminists. So lots of exciting work. This is not the end, but once again, a sincere, sincere, sincere thank you to Susanna, to Paige, and to Cheyenne for sharing your, your wisdom today. It's been such a pleasure, and I've, I've personally learned so, so much. Thank you, folks. But with that, um, good night, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining from, and we'll see you next week. Bye now. <laughs>